may I now invite Simon to share with us on the ship emission in PRD region and the benefits and challenges of a PRD eco. Simon, please. Uh, welcome back from the coffee break. Uh, it's me again. Uh, now, um, let me explain. Uh, originally, we had um, Professor Alan Zhang from the Ch uh, South China University of Technology to give this presentation. But this is going to be about uh, a research project that I work uh, together with Alan. Um, and uh, but unfortunately, he is now in Beijing uh, in another very important meeting, so he can't uh, come to Hong Kong to give the presentation. So I've got the honor to uh, present on behalf of Alan and also uh, his team. Uh, uh, we've got a few of Alan's students in the room as well, so if I fail to convey the correct message and if I fail to answer your questions afterwards, then uh, the students will step up and help. Um, but as I said, this is uh, about uh, a project that I'm working closely with Alan uh, over the last 12 months, and we are getting close to completing the emission inventory for the Pearl River Delta region. Um, I did a similar study a few years ago, and that's only on ocean-going vessels. Um, but this time, we felt that um, if we are planning for an emission control area, uh, this is the first piece of research that we need to set the scene uh, to really understand the baseline emission before we consider any control measures and to move forward with the emission control area idea. So this is the reason and rationale behind this study. Um, so this is the outline. I'm going to very quickly go through the background and then the methodology, which is very similar to the study that I did a few years ago for Hong Kong. Um, and uh, we will go through the characteristics of shipping activities in the region. Um, then I will spend a few minutes on the emission from ships in the PRD, as, uh, as well as you know, sharing with you some of the numbers from Hong Kong. Okay, now um, for those who are familiar with this region, the Pearl River Delta region, uh, and of course uh, the Guangdong province, um, we have a lot of uh, big ports here. Um, the major ports include Guangzhou and Shenzhen, but then we also have uh, the second tier or the uh, slightly smaller ports like uh, Huizhou, uh, Humen, uh, etc. And they are, you know, serving as a feeder port to the bigger port. Now, if we think broader, um, beyond the boundary, of course, Hong Kong is one of the major ports in the region as well. So, uh, in terms of emission infantry and thinking about the baseline, I think we should take a regional approach and think about Hong Kong plus Shenzhen plus Guangzhou and also the smaller ports together so that we know uh, how big the issues is uh, without forgetting also Macau, even though Macau is a relatively smaller port, but they are also part of the PRD and we should also involve Macau in the conversation uh, in the future. Um, and, you know, the major ports in this region, as I mentioned, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, Hong Kong. Actually, these three ports are within the top 10 of the world's container port in the last few years. And the most recent number, which is I think for 2013, uh, Guangzhou is the number eight ports in the world in terms of container throughputs, Hong Kong being the number four, and Shenzhen actually already leapfrogged uh, Hong Kong and become the number three in the world uh, behind Shanghai and Singapore. Okay, and that's why I think it is reasonable and timely to start thinking about the environmental impact, especially air pollution coming from the vessels in, the, uh, in this region with all these very dense and uh, very you know, uh, uh, regular uh, marine activities. Okay, now for the emission infantry. Now I know some of you in the room actually also involved in the compilation of emission infantry. So you should be quite familiar with this uh, generic or basic uh, equation. Uh, when it comes to the estimation of emissions coming from ships, 
uh, whether it's uh, individual ship or whether it's a group of uh, vessels uh, under the same vessel category. Basically, we need to know a number of information in order to come up with the estimation. Uh, definitely the number of vessels coming into the area, so we need to know the number of calls. Uh, whether uh, it's a vessel arrival or departure, we need to get a sense of the scale of the you know operation. We need to know the power of the vessels. So if we can go down to individual vessels level, that would be great. So if I know this vessel uh, having a certain you know power uh, for their engine and also for their boiler and auxiliary engine, then we can come up with a much more accurate estimation of the emission coming from this ship. Of course, sometimes these information are not available then probably we, we have to come up with estimates for a certain category of vessels, say for a bulk carrier. Uh, we can come up with an average uh, you know, uh, power for their main engine and then use that as a surrogate to calculate the emission for the, for the whole group, for the whole vessel group or category. Um, the finer the information, the more accurate or the finer will be your estimation. It will help to come up with much effective and better control measures, that's for sure. Um, another information that's important would be the load factor or the loading of the engine when they are in operation. Of course, when uh, a vessel is at berth, the main engine will be uh, basically shut down so there'll be no loading. But then for the auxiliary engine and the boiler, there will be some loading. It could be 50%, it could be 30%, depending on the usage of the, you know, the power. For cruise ships, for example, when they are at berth, um, the auxiliary engine power loading will be quite high because they still need the auxiliary engine to provide power and electricity for the customers, for the passengers. But for other vessel types, maybe the loading could be different. So this, these are, once again, the very important information for us to come up with a much better estimation of the emission. Now, um, we need also to know the uh, timing mode, uh, the time that the vessel is at birth, the time when the vessel is underway sailing from the boundary of the international water into a certain port, um, the speed and the type of, um, you know, I, I mean, the speed and the time uh, a vessel is uh, using uh, in different operation mode would be also critical for us to come up with a better estimation. And last but not least, we need to know the emission factor, and that's uh, related to the type of fuel that's been using related to the type of air pollution we are talking about. And we have a lot of good internationally uh, uh, de derived emission factors that we can choose for. Now, bearing in mind that we are focusing partly on ocean-going vessels that sails across the, the world. So basically for ocean-going vessels, we can use uh, internationally de derived emission factors. I think uh, it should be okay. Now, but for river vessels or the local vessels, which operate in a much you know, um, defined local area with maybe very uh, unique operational characteristics, then it will be good to m go and measure their own emission factor for different pollution. It would be much better in terms of coming up with a good estimate for the emission. But then, of course, it involves a lot of work. I understand that, say, in Shanghai, in Guangzhou, in different mainland Chinese ports, they're trying to measure, they're trying to monitor, they're trying to come up with their own emission factors for local vessels and for river vessels. I think this is, uh, they're moving in the right direction. But for Hong Kong, uh, when you talk a lot about the ocean going vessels, basically we can just use the internationally recognized emission factor to do the estimation. So these are the, the signs. I know it's a bit boring, very technical, but this is the basis for us to come up with very good emission uh, estimates numbers. Uh, in the last session, I mentioned the automatic identification system. Originally, this is for, uh, for maritime safety. So basically, uh, the um, marine authority, they want to make sure that they know where the vessels are uh, to avoid collision or you know, just to make sure that they are safely operating in the harbor area. But then with all the information embedded in this AIS system, we can then tell the trajectory of the vessel, the path of the vessel, the speed of the vessel, the exact location of the vessels, and combine that with the information uh, of individual vessels and also about the fuel quality and the emission factor that I just mentioned about. Then we can come up with very fine, 
very accurate emission estimate for individual vessels based on their operation, operation pattern and operation rules. So I think uh, by using the AI, AIS data, this is really a breakthrough so that we can now, uh, if I want to pinpoint to say that this vessel actually uh, emit this certain amount of sulfur dioxide because they are using this route and traveling in this, in this speed using 1.2% uh, sulfur fuel for that long period of time. Now, of course, uh, for emission control uh, reasons, they don't need to go down to that level. But then when we aggregate all these emission numbers together, then we can come up with these big pictures that would help us to identify the best solution to reduce ship emissions in the port area. But we have to start from the bottom. We have to start with the, the finest number so that we can come up with the bigger picture. And that's why uh, I've been reiterating a number of times, the finer your emission inventory, the better for you to come up with the best control scenarios. But then of course it's time consuming. It could be quite costly as well. Um, so for ports which haven't e n ever done any emission inventory, I think they sh should start with something less fine. I mean, they can come up with a very coarse estimate at the very beginning in the first time, but then they can further refine their inventory so that in the future they can come up with much better solutions. Um, now these are the kind of data that we need to go through. We have to do a lot of data cleaning, data mining. We have to do a lot of analysis, whether we group them into certain vessel group, uh, vessel types, and then we have to do a lot of calculation. Sometimes the uh, ship data are not uh, complete, even if we are taking data from the Lloyd's Registry or from other classification systems. Sometimes they are missing data. We have to look around the internet or even to contact the shipping companies to try to fill those information gaps, and these are very tedious work. But these are worthwhile once we got the data. As I said, we will then come up with a much better emission inventory to move forward together. Um, okay, now um, for the database that Alan has been using uh, in his part of the study with uh, his team in Guangzhou, uh, they are using uh, a vessel registration database that uh, cover over 10,000 vessels, including uh, some ocean-going vessels and river vessels and local vessels, okay? Um, and with information such as the tonnage, um, the uh, equipments, including the main engine, also engines and boiler, you know, the made of the equipment, the size of the equipment, so on and so forth. And also with the understanding about their operating pattern in terms of their routes and trajectory, um, with all this information, then uh, this is, as I said, a very time-consuming data collection phase, but a very worthwhile exercise to do because once you get all this information, then in the future you can reuse the data. You know, sometimes the vessels' uh, movement, the routes they are taking wouldn't change all the time. And basically the vessel information, they will be the same uh, for, for, the, for the entire life of the vessel unless they are doing retrofitting. So this is a once and for all kind of exercise that will help you to build the database and with the database then you can come up with a much better number. Okay, now um, I'm, I'm not going to go into this, this chart because it's, uh, this is also once again another way to demonstrate how we do the calculation. But you can see uh, in the green level we have different data sources, and then the factors that we have to incorporate in the calculation, and then we will come up with the infantry with the numbers, okay? Um, now this is uh, a distribution map showing the age of the vessels. Now in this particular situation with the Pearl River Delta region, as we try to break down by ocean going vessels, coastal vessels, and river vessels, we know that um, for the river vessels actually the vessels are quite old in terms of their age. For the coastal vessels, actually they are pretty new because there's been a lot of replacement in the last few years. For the ocean going vessels, it's half and half. Okay, just to give you a sense, I know it's a bit crowded, uh, the, you know, the, the map or, or, or the diagram here. Now we will um, very likely share all the PowerPoints uh, in our website uh, after the conference with the consent uh, from the, you know, the speakers. 
and then you'll be able to you know dig into all these details. So I, I wouldn't go into that now, but there are a lot of information out there uh, in the in the PowerPoint, and you can you know go go back and look at it later. In terms of the vessel type and the tonnage, now um, for ocean grain vessels, I'm sure you know the major types: uh, fully cellular container vessels, cargo vessels, dry bulk carriers oil tankers and also the passenger carriers. In terms of tonnage, it really depends on the vessel types and then there will be a wide range in terms of the tonnage. So for container, container vessels, it could go up to, you know, like um, hundreds of thousands of tons, okay? But for maybe um, a cruise ship, okay, it could be a bit smaller, but then we, you know, uh, last week we have a very huge cruise ship coming into Hong Kong. So you can compare that with, with say, the cruise ship that's been using Ocean Terminal. Uh, I mean, it's like a 16-story building compared with a, you know, small house, okay? So this is the range of vessels we're talking about. And this is also a challenge for us to do, you know, uh, emission infantry and, you know, to do the science, because we really have to cover a wide range of uh, vessel types. Uh, we just cannot take the middle and say, you know, this is the typical, or this is the average tonnage, or this is the average kind of practice, because it's so varied out there. Sometimes we need to be careful in terms of how we come up with, you know, meaningful uh, categorization so that we can really reflect the characteristic of a certain vessel type and with a certain tonnage uh, size. Timing mode and load factor, uh, once again, you know, you can see uh, in the purple color, it's a long birthing time in the Pearl River Delta region for most of the vessel types. So you would imagine if I were one of the officials in Guangzhou or in Shenzhen, definitely looking into at birth emission and find a way to cut the emission at birth would be very effective based on this diagram. Okay, so these are the information that we need, uh, or not me, but for policymakers, so that this is the evidence for them to pinpoint, okay, we should do something here because we see this evidence. At birth, emission is huge here, and that's why we need to do something. Okay, now um, I'm going to share with you some numbers. Uh, now these are unverified numbers. We will go through a process of verification to make sure that the numbers are in good order but just as a preliminary kind of results from the research. Um, you can see Guangzhou, Shenzhen, definitely they are the two biggest port in this region, uh, excluding Hong Kong. And therefore, in terms of emission, they are taking the biggest share. Okay, so for SO2, for sulfur dioxide, for example, out of the, um, the 41,000 ton, uh, Guangzhou and Shenzhen combined already contributed 20, 28,000 tons, which is more than half, 60 to 70 percent. Okay, and for NOx and for other major pollutants, it is similar. Now, this is 2013 figures. This is the latest figures that we can get based on the data that we collected. And this is uh, an attempt to compare the 2013 emission profile with the one that Alan did for 2010. And you can see the pattern is more or less the same. Most of the emissions are coming from Guangzhou, Shenzhen, which are the two big ports in the region, okay? And it is also in line with their throughputs. Uh, as I said, Guangzhou and Shenzhen, they are in the top 10 uh, of the world's container port in the world. Um, and so, you know, basically, accordingly, they emit much more than the other smaller ports uh, in the second tier. Okay, and in terms of the vessel types and the contribution, now the biggest contributor uh, still, you know, just like Hong Kong, is container ships. But then interestingly, look at the, the pie chart, you also see a lot of contribution from fishing vessels. Now, I, this is something that probably I also need to talk to Alan and his team about the operation in terms of the scale of operation of the fishing, fishing trade in southern China and whether that's a major, you know, reasons why the emissions. Please. Oh, because Yantian and Nansha, uh, uh, now Yantian is part of Shenzhen, so that's being grouped. Yes, and Nansha is part of Guangzhou port. 
Okay, but I think it, because we use a bottom-up approach to come up with the emission inventory, we can then single out if it is useful to say, okay, Yen 10, the emission will be so and so, and then for Nansha, for Shekho Port, for Daichan Bay, you know, we, we can have different numbers. We can go down to that level, yes. But this is just, you know, a snapshot of what we've got so far and to share with the, the delegates here, okay? Now, um, going back to my last point about fishing vessels. Now, this is big because we're talking about more than a, a quarter of emission coming from fishing vessels uh, for SO2 and for NOx and also for the other pollutants. But then uh, when you look at the other major contributor, uh, we are talking about uh, cargo ships and bulk carriers, so more or less the same as in Hong Kong. Now, this is uh, the pie chart for the other two pollutants, PM10 and VOCs. Okay, and you can see similar pattern. So, um, you know, uh, in the last session, we mentioned briefly about the incentive scheme in Sunjin, and uh, our friends from Sunjin is going to talk a, a lot more in, in the afternoon, but I think um, the incentive scheme also targets the container trade. Basically, they provide incentives for vessels, and mainly they are container vessels operating in Yantian and in Shekho, uh, in particular, uh, to switch fuel and also to use shoreside power. And I think they are, you know, focusing on, uh, on, on the right uh, player because container vessels, they contributed a lot of emissions in Sunjin. Okay. Um, now, this is another chart just to show the distribution uh, among the major cities in, in, in the area. And of course, when I said major cities, uh, usually this, these cities also have their own port, and that's why uh, you, know, you can see this pattern. And um, basically, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, and Huizhou, uh, they adding up their emission, they contribute 70% of the emission. Okay, now from the policy perspective, of course, if you can go and convince these major cities that this is something you should take care of because it's affecting your people, affecting your image, affecting the air quality, um, and if, they, if you get their buy-in, then it will be very effective because you only have to convince three major cities and try to add together and we'll come up with a very good solution. Similarly, when we talk about the major vessel types contributing to emissions, the container vessels, the dry bulk carrier, oil tanker, and in the case in you know, Guangdong, the fishing vessels, if we can pull them together and try to do something together to cut down emissions from these, emission, uh, from these vessel types, then once again, we can be fairly effective in terms of coming up with better solutions. So I think this is good news for policymakers in terms of finding or ident identifying the right kind of measures to help the sectors to clean up. Okay, now um, back to my territory, okay? Ship emissions in Hong Kong. Uh, very recently, I think it's last week or if not the week before, um, Hong Kong EPD, they uh, published the latest uh, air pollutant emission inventory for 2013, okay? And you can see once again, emissions coming from ships in yellow color uh, for SO2 is 50%, okay? And for NOx is 31%. For PM is 36, PM10, okay? Uh, the government called it respirable suspended particulate, RSP. Okay, and for the finer particulate is 42%. So basically, you know, if you look across the, the, the six bars, um, ship is still the number one local air pollution source in Hong Kong, based on the emission inventory compiled by EPD. Okay, so once again, it kind of convinced that we are moving in the right direction. The action that's been initiated by the industry, taken up and supported by the government, uh, basically we are doing the right thing. Um, and hopefully with all the measures, with the regulation coming into force next week, we could see this bar going down. And also the PM, but not the NOx, because uh, by switching fuel, basically you are not we are not going to do anything to help reduce NOx emission. But then definitely for SO2 emission and also for PM emission, there will be a lot of improvement. Hopefully next year. Oh, okay. Now I try to plot or not plot, but put uh, the Hong Kong numbers against 
uh, the PLD numbers. And you can see you know, on Hong Kong at the bottom row, okay? Um, we're talking about 15,000 tons of SO2 compared to Guangzhou, which is 16. Uh, Shenzhen, roughly 12.5. We are you know, more or less in the, in the same scale. And it makes sense because in terms of uh, operation, Hong Kong, Shenzhen, and uh, Guangzhou now is operating in a similar scale. So I think naturally, in terms of emission, it's pretty much the same. But of course, if we dig down into the details, we can find some dissimil uh, dissimilarities. But then if you look at the aggregate number, we are talking about emission levels in the same scale. And I think the same applies to the other pollutants. Uh, NOx, we're talking about 35,000 here in Hong Kong um, based on EPD's number. But then we have 31,000 in Guangzhou and 21 in Shenzhen. Okay, so I think we are in, in the right order. Now, but then think about the aggregate number. Okay, we are in the same region. But then for our friends uh, in Guangzhou doing this research, they only focus on the north of the, the boundary, the border. Okay, they only work on uh, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, and the second tier ports in the Peripheral Delta region without considering Hong Kong. So now I put back the Hong Kong number and try to give you a much more comprehensive regional picture. And then you can see that at least, now, as I said, the numbers without verific verification at this point. But then we can tell that for the Peripheral Delta region as a whole, including Hong Kong, we are talking about 56,000 or 57,000 tons of SO2, rather than just 41, if we only consider Guangzhou, Shenzhen, and the smaller ports. Now, I haven't added Macau to the equation, but I would imagine Macau's emission will be relatively small compared to Hong Kong, Guangzhou, and Shenzhen. But then, this will then give you the regional picture that we need as we move on to start thinking about and trying to discuss the prospect of setting up an emission control area because we have to do it together as a region. And to achieve that, we have to have the emission number for the entire region in place and in good order. Okay, so um, hopefully with these numbers, we can then move on and start thinking about whether it's worthwhile to push for an ECA concept here in Hong Kong and also in the Peripheral Delta region because these are big numbers. These are big numbers and we have to do something to address the problem. So I think this is the end of you know, me uh, presenting for Alan uh, for, for the first part of the, you know, for this session. Thank you very much. Now, I, I have to apologize for being on the stage for so long, and you must, you know, be so frustra frustrated with my face, but, um, and also standing between you and lunch. Uh, so I will try to be concise and uh, maybe entertaining uh, with this presentation. Um, now, just 60 seconds ago, I talked about um, the emission inventory or the baseline numbers that we now have uh, before verific verific verification, okay? Um, so we know that, you know, we are talking about, uh, you know, an area with a lot of uh, maritime activities. We are talking about an area that we are having uh, 40 plus million of inhabitants, people working, living their life there, uh, with their health being affected and exposed to different sorts of air pollution, and some of them are coming from ships and port-related uh, activities. Um, and with Hong Kong now going to have the regulation to control at birth fuel switching, which is a small but important first step. I think uh, for civic exchange, we really want to pave the way to start, to start the second phase of engagement with the industry and also with government departments including some of our friends from abroad, and that's why we uh, bring in experts from the US, from Europe, and also from uh, mainland 
to try to uh, be part of this conversation because we know they have a lot of ex experience to share with us, to help us and guide us forward together. But then we need to you know, understand our house, okay? We have to make sure that we know what's the problem and the scale of the problem here. And that's why I emphasize the importance of getting the emission infantry done for the region. Now, um, the infantry that I just shared with you is the latest that we, we have uh, for this region. Uh, and the base year is 2013, okay? We haven't yet done anything beyond the emission estimate numbers. But then the natural next step would be to use the numbers to feed them into air, dispers air dispersion models to see ship emissions impact on air quality in the regional scale, and then to try to translate those impacts into health effects. Because this is what every one of you probably are most concerned about. So if we have 10 more ships emitting this many tons of SO2 or PM, what would it affect our health indirectly? Now we know that there will be a dispersion process. That's why we need the dispersion model to do the estimation. And once the air pollutant has been dispersed, when it reaches the recipients like ourselves, what would be the impact on our health? These are the genuine and important questions that we need to answer, okay? Now, I have to say, um, we haven't done that part yet with the, two, uh, the 2013 emission infantry, but we have done it with uh, our last infantry, which is uh, the 2008 infantry that I did with uh, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology and also Hong Kong U Public Health School, uh, and we published a report back in 2012 Okay, with that report, we can demonstrate the health effect, health impact of ship emissions in this region. And then we come up with some recommendations. And one of the recommendations actually is to set up an emission control area in this part of the world. Now, I will go through uh, very quickly the research, the key findings, but then probably we'll focus more on the subject of an emission control area in the Pearl River Delta region and what will be the key challenges that lies ahead of us, uh, I mean, for every one of us, just not, not just for research, researchers like ourselves or think tank like ourselves, but also for the industry players, for government officials, for fuel suppliers, for the shippers, for the container terminal operators, so on and so forth. They will all be affected because the eco concept doesn't only apply to ocean going vessels. It basically applies to every vessel operating in that designated area. It will include river vessels, it will include local vessels. It will therefore include the uh, operators of terminals, fuel supplies, so on and so forth. So we are talking about a much bigger chain uh, of uh, sectors here. Okay, now, um, reasons why we are concerned. Of course, now this is, uh, once again, uh, taken from Professor Corbett's research back in 2007. And this map focuses on Asia, and uh, I don't think I need any explanation because you should be very familiar with the location and the geography of uh, East and Southeast Asia, and you know the red dots are you know basically the Chinese coastline. We have some in, uh, in Japan, Korea, Singapore is here. Okay, this is Indian booming maritime market, and we are all in trouble because there are so much PM 2.5 emission in those areas, and we are all being exposed to the health risk associated with these emissions. That's, that's why we need to be very concerned. Um, secondly, you know, basically the same map but with different information. Look at the top 10 container ports in the world. Nine of them are in East and Southeast Asia, seven of them in China. These are the latest number that I can pull around from the internet, based uh, mainly from IMO, um, uh, 2013 numbers. And, okay, just look at this red dot. This is Perifer Delta region, including Hong Kong, Shenzhen, and Guangzhou. We are talking about a combined 61 million TEU in 2013. This is 10% of the world's container throughput. Okay, so imagining 10% of the boxes coming through uh, this region 
And I have to tell you, most of the boxes and the vessels will cut through Hong Kong because we are surrounded by all the major sea routes coming into this part of the world. Okay, so the study uh, is a three parts, so actually four parts, but we involve three parties. Um, so we have the emission inventory done by uh, Hong Kong UST, and actually I was working there when we did this part of the study. Then we use the emission numbers and feed into a dispersion model so we understand the dispersion of the pollutions coming from ships. We then provide Hong Kong U Public Health School with the numbers so that they can estimate the health impact. So this is the second study, which is the health impact assessment. With the health impact assessment and the infantry number, Civic Exchange prepared a, a policy document basically to suggest what we should do based on the evidence in terms of emission control for ships. Okay, and this is the spatial distribution of ship, ship emissions, uh, only SO2. Now, I have to say that this is a limitation of this study because we only focus on number one ocean going vessels and among all the pollutants because we really want to identify or single out the impact of one pollutant and try to relate that with health impact. And at that time, we can only do it with SO2 because with PM, it is very complicated. We can't single out ship and say this part of the health impact is contributed by ships because uh, we have primary and then we have secondary PM and it's so complex. Um, it will basically you know, uh, drag on and on if we really want to go for that. So we only focus on SO2. But then I can tell you, of course, PM10 or PM215 emission is much more toxic than SO2. So to a certain extent, the numbers that I'm going to show you in terms of health impact actually is an underestimation of the health impact. The real impact should be much, 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 much higher when we consider the other pollutants, especially with PM uh, in the equation. Okay, but then you can tell the, the pattern. Hong Kong, the red dots, that's familiar, right? Um, and Yen Tian here and Sun Jun here, okay. Um, and all the vessels coming through the major sea lane and some of them actually cutting through Hong Kong, as I said, and then using uh, Hong Kong's uh, pilots to navigate all the way up to Sheko. Okay, and they use this sea lane to go to Yantian. And Hong Kong is right in the middle, and we, of course we have a lot of vessels going up to Guangzhou uh, through the Pearl River estuary. Okay, now, um, mind you, this is only ocean-going vessels. There will be a lot more river vessels going this way all the, up to, all the way up to Guangzhou. Okay, so once again, this is an underestimation. Okay, now we come up with three different, uh, sorry, four different control scenarios. And I won't go through each one of them. Actually, I think after lunch break, we will have copies of the report. If you want to take one, um, you can ask our colleagues for the report. Um, but I just want to focus on option three, which is the control, uh, emission control area, ECA, uh, which means we are going to switch to 0.1% sulfur fuel. Okay, what will happen if we do that? Remember the color scheme, okay? We have the red, the orange, the yellow. But then if we turn to control scenario number three, which is setting up an emission control area, all the red and orange colors are basically gone and it's just much cleaner, okay? Compared to the other scenarios, this one is basically regulating the fairway shutter, which we are now doing in a few days time. and. This is um, you know, asking vessels to switch fuel when they enter Hong Kong waters. So it's another step further compared to the at birth fuel switching. And the last one would be slow steaming or to reduce vessel speed. Okay, and you can see uh, in terms of the emission reduction, it will be limited, it will be relatively less compared to having the, an emission control area in this region. And the improvement is very drastic here with emission control area because we are switching to 0.1% of a fuel, number one. And number two, different types of vessels have to comply. And number three, they will have to do it all the way within 100 nautical miles based on this uh, scenario. Uh, when they enter this area, they have to switch uh, compared to only switching at birth. Okay. Now, these are more concrete numbers in terms of health impact. So for control measure number three, we will be able to reduce 91% of the health impact, mainly uh, premature death and also hospitalization. Okay, compared to, you know, 44% uh, 
to 62% uh, in, uh, in terms of control measures one and two. So very simple, if we go for emission control area because of the factors that I just mentioned, emission will go down very quickly and health will be protected. Okay, now, but then what's a, an emission control area? Now this is something under the IMO regulatory framework. This is what the industry like. Now, not to say that they like an ECA because we will, we're going to have a discussion about whether they think it is the right time to have an ECA discussion or whether they feel that they have some concerns. Uh, we're going to share that uh, later uh, this afternoon and tomorrow. But then at least this is something what I call consistent uh, around the world. So if we go for ECA, you know what you get from IMO. Okay, we're not talking about a very different kind of requirements. We're talking about IMO regulation that everyone knows. And then the practice and the problems, the issues, the challenges is very transparent, okay? Um, right now, we have four ECAs, two in Europe, the Baltic Sea and the North Sea area. Now, I put down SICA here because they only control SOX, sulfur oxide emissions. So they are called uh, the sulfur emission control area. But for the North American area and also the United States Caribbean Sea area, uh, we are talking about a SICA and a NICA. So basically it's a, a full emission control area controlling both sulfur oxides and nitrogen oxides and also PM, of course, okay? Now, um, we are here. So for the red line, this is the ECA requirement, which is 0.1% sulfur fuel, but then the global cap is 3.5%, which will go down hopefully in 2020, but you know, I understand that discussions are going on uh, within IMO, probably they will be delayed to 2025. 20, there will be a lot more discussion between now and then, um, but definitely for the ECA requirement, it gone down to 0.1% uh, 1st of January this year. And there are also requirements for NOx uh, in the e ECA. Um, basically, we are talking about different uh, engine standards for NOx emission, and I'm sure some of the experts in the room will go into further detail uh, either this afternoon or tomorrow with the technical workshop, so I think I will just leave it uh, from here. Um, why? I think uh, I mentioned about the uh, health improvement potential and the emission reduction potential, and definitely under the IMO regulatory framework, this is much more welcome by the industry because, as I said, this is very transparent. We know what is required and we also have a lot of options to comply with the requirements. Now, uh, back to the region very quickly. Um, we are not the only group uh, asking for an ECA in the Peru Delta region. Actually, in the Clean Air Plan published by the government, uh, they mentioned that longer term, their vision is to have the whole area, the Pearl River Delta region, to become an emission control area under the IMO. So this is in the government air quality blueprint. This is for real, I think. Uh, it's a matter of when and how to get there. Not just in Hong Kong, actually in Sunjin, uh, as early as 2012, uh, well not in Sunjin, but also you know in, in the Pearl River Delta region, under this uh, building a quality living area uh, planning procedure, they also mentioned they will study and explore the establishment of an emission control area in greater PLD water, right at the very bottom here. So in black and white, they also mentioned that this is possible. They are exploring back in 2012. And in 2013, uh, the Sunjin Air Quality Enhancement Plan, and very specific, specifically, uh, and I apologize, this is in Chinese only, they also mentioned the ECA. Now, and I think Miss um, Xu in the afternoon, she will also talk a bit more about Sunjun's uh, current initiatives and definitely ECA is on the agenda. So this is very encouraging. So Hong Kong is not alone and our neighbor actually is also willing to start exploring and to start talking about how to set up an ECA in this region. Now I think this is my last slide. Um, before we can go that far, let's be realistic because there are so many issues to be resolved and addressed. Um, we have to open, we have to have all of you to contribute uh, your ideas and your concerns, but I think the key challenges or the key issues 
basically fall under three categories. One would be related to the technical and operations. Okay, whether we have technology available to comply with the ECA requirement, which is much tighter, whether we have enough fuel, 0.1 percent of the fuel, and we have Eddie uh, talking about that in the afternoon. Um, fuel switching, uh, it seems a very common practice now, but I think there are still people compa complain about, you know, operation-wise, there will be problems related to fuel switching. And Penny will address that, I think, this afternoon and probably tomorrow as well. Now, secondly, and probably very importantly, uh, the cost implications. Who is going to pay? There will be a compliance cost, and who is responsible, or who are responsible? How many parties should share the bill? Should the government be subsidizing, or should the shipping trade bear all the costs? Uh, what about the shippers? I'm buying cheap, but I don't know the full cost behind you know, what I'm paying. But if uh, the, the shippers is going green, then they have to pay more transport costs. Am I, as a consumer, willing to pay more to support that initiatives? I think at the end of the day, it comes down to every one of us, whether we are willing to take up that responsibility as well as we consume. So this is a genuine question, and I cannot answer that question myself. Uh, not, not that my team uh, at Survey Change can do that. I think we have to do it together, openly and transparently, with every one of you. And lastly, economic issues, competitiveness. If Hong Kong, together with Guangzhou and Shenzhen, is becoming much more stringent in terms of the regulation uh, and to control ship emissions, will the ships, uh, will, will, I mean, will the shipper choose another mode instead of going by sea, will they go by land? Is it the better option for them and also for the environment as a whole? So this is question number one. And uh, will some of the vessels, instead of coming to PLD, go to Shanghai and Yangtze River Delta? Now that's another genuine question because it will then affect the economic development and the shipping and port sectors in this region. Um, are we worried? Can we do some analysis to at least clarify what will be the key factors affecting possible modal and port shift and competition and how can we address that together? I think these are very useful and important questions. So what should we do next? More research. That's what I'd like to do. Uh, I need funding. <laughs> um, but then, more importantly, I think, um, we need continuous stakeholders' engagement um, with the industry, but not just the shipping industry or the shipping sector, but also, as I said, the port sector, the shippers, the supply chain sector, the technology solution providers, the fuel suppliers. These are all important sectors that we need to engage to sit around the table and to discuss. We need to talk within the region so it's not just Hong Kong doing our own talking. We need to talk with our neighbors uh, in Shenzhen, in Guangzhou together. Uh, I, I mentioned in the last you know, uh, panel, um, there are non-government dialogue going on. And we, we, we hope there will be more to come, not just between civic exchange and someone else, but between different institutions so that we can do more research together. We can share experience, we can work together very e effectively. And I think at the end of the day, if you understand how IMO works and how the ECA concept works, it has to go through the Chinese central government to apply to IMO for an ECA because uh, we need a member state to submit an application. So Hong Kong obviously cannot submit an application. PLD, sorry cannot submit an application. We have to go through Beijing. Now, the good news is, as Christine mentioned earlier, China as a whole, they understand that port and ship is uh, an important emission source. And there's, there's been a lot of discussion in the mainland China at a very high level to think about different control measures and scenarios to cut ship emissions and port emissions. And definitely, ECA is one of the options on the agenda. So we need to show that we are ready to move forward with research and with the industry support. And I think this is the next step. And, um, and the same remarks uh, as I want to end the presentation, we need all your help together. And let's you know, um, take this journey together effectively in the next few years. Thank you. Now, I'm sorry I have to stay on stage because I'm going to moderate myself. 
uh, for the Q&A session. <laughs> um, no, it's not my show, it's your show, to be honest. Um, but you know, I'll be happy to be here to facilitate the discussion. Um, I think we have like 15 minutes before lunch. I don't want to keep you long in this chilling room. I think you need some uh, energy uh, and you need to eat. Um, but you know, uh, you have 15 minutes for questions. Jeff, oh, sorry. Yeah, my name is Sudhir Vimani from anglo Eastern Ship Management. Uh, very good slides and a lot of information in your presentation. My suggestion to you and people from China, Hong Kong, and all the developed countries, we have an easy solution of cold ironing, hmm. where you put off the power, and the power is given by shore. If you do this, then no socks, no knocks, no particular matter, and the health of the people also is not affected. Why don't China go for seven ports, which are having a lot of pollution for cold ironing? Many ships which are coming to Chinese ports, they already have this facility because they are going to Los Angeles and many other ports in US and Europe where cold ironing is possible. This will remove all the problems in your second line last slide uh, because there is no competition mm. no issues whatsoever about the fuel compatibility availability and all the problems will be solved so i would like to recommend china should go in those seven to ten ports all out for coal ironing facilities thank you well thank you for your comments and uh, maybe part questions as well i agree um, now you well, thank you for bringing up uh, coal ironing again. And actually, um, we call it onshore power or shore side power here and or OPS elsewhere. Um, we're talking about the same technology, same idea. And now I, can, I cannot speak on behalf of uh, mainland China, but I know and maybe my friends from the mainland can uh, confirm. Actually, they are also you know, exploring the possibility of adding uh, coal ironing or onshore power facilities in the major ports. I know Shanghai, they've got a huge plan to do that uh, in the next few years. Um, you will probably hear more from uh, our speakers from Shanghai in the afternoon. Um, for Hong Kong, of course, I, I think, you know, for me and also probably for civic change, we are taking a uh, technology neutral kind of approach. So uh, we welcome different options to reduce emissions from ships and from the port sector. Um, whether it's scrubber, whether it's a different type of fuel, whether it's coal ironing, whether it's uh, S SCR, um, we welcome different options. I think for the government, is for them to set the standards. F it is really up to the users or the operators to choose which option is the most time and cost effective options now um now this is my this is my uh my perspective you might not agree with, with me but um i think um co-ironing will have uh, its own benefits but i disagree with you uh, by just saying that there will be no socks or NOx or pm emission because it really depends on you know what you are burning in your power plant okay if not if you're burning dirty fuel uh, in your power generation sector, then you're basically transferring your emission from the port area to the power plants. But then, of course, even though there's a transfer of emission from the port area to a power plant, there will be some health benefits because usually living close to the port area, there will be lots of people and the health impact will be much reduced. So there will be a lot of gains. But then let's not forget those who will be affected by power plant emission somewhere further away from the port area. So I think this is the kind of questions that I welcome because this, this is not a straightforward question and there's no straightforward answers. Uh, it's location specific. In Hong Kong, we might have to come up with a different solution or a different uh, choice. But elsewhere, say in India or in China, uh, because of a certain situation, maybe they should go for co-ironing or maybe should go for, uh, they should go for a uh, fuel switching. Um, so that's why I say we shouldn't be too fixated with just one option. We should be open to different options. Depending on where you are, you can pick the right options. Hi, I'm Jeff from the cruise terminal. My, uh, my question is just about um, tactics 
Um, I, I think you know the the PRD ECA is is a good idea, but um, it seems like um, wouldn't it be more effective to have an ECA that covers all of China. If, if you already have to go through the central government, if you already have to have some, some PRC national standards and agreement in place, I mean, obviously, to do something international among, among the nations of North Asia would take forever. You might as well just wait for the IMO to do it. But, but um, I mean, it, do you feel like tactically you can get it done quicker by this? Because from a competition standpoint, of course, you know, the, the PRD ports compete with the Yangtze River Delta ports. Mm -hmm. And so it, it does create a sort of lopsided um, um, economic playing field, even, even just among the Chinese ports. But maybe you can, can get much more benefit with only, you know, slightly more effort. Well, uh, Jeff, I uh, privately, I, I agree with you. This is actually my ultimate goal, personally. Um, it's not just about Pearl River Delta region. It's not just about Yangtze River Delta region. Uh, it's about the entire Chinese coastline. Um, but I think one thing that we have to acknowledge is the fact that along the Chinese coastline, uh, even within uh, you know specific uh, Delta region areas, we are talking about uh, a cluster of ports in different stages of development and in different size and scale. Um, just take the PLD as an example. Um, Hong Kong is a very advanced port with uh, huge throughput. Same applies to Shenzhen. Shenzhen has, you know, it's, it's catching up, um, and so they they have a much bigger throughput than Hong Kong now. And in terms of uh, ship control, they are now also catching up, which is great because with Hong Kong plus Shenzhen, then basically we have uh, two big partners in this region to go for something very similar. But then Guangzhou and all the smaller ports in Guangdong, some of them may not want to go that far in terms of tightening the regulation. So they will argue they would rather be less stringent in their regulation so that they can get more business. I think this is also something that we have to consider. So even within the Pearl River Delta region, we cannot at this point agree that we can move forward together with the big and the small ports. Um, and that's a real barrier. Now, uh, this is something that hopefully uh, in the next few years, gradually we can resolve. And similarly, in Yangtze River Delta, Shanghai very obviously is the, the big port. But then uh, there are other ports in Suzhou, in Zhejiang, uh, Nanjing is another port. You know, um, they have to consider, you know, every players together. So they, they, they want to lead, but they can't just go off the chart, so to speak. And that's why I think uh, an eco along the Chinese coastline will come. But then maybe tactically, we want to first focus on the key areas and to make sure that within the key areas, we have enough players agreeing to go for an eco first. And once these key areas turn into an eco, then I think it's a matter of time, the entire Chinese coastline will become an eco. But I agree with you that this is the ultimate goal. But you know, knowing that there are some barriers right now uh, facing, you know, these uh, ports who are competing against one another, and the smaller ports actually are looking for more business. Uh, it will be a bit tricky to to say, okay, we want to go for for the big plan. Um, but I, I am with you. I, I agree that's the ultimate things that we need to do. I'm Samuel from Yantan. Um, I, I have just a very simple question. I would like to ask, do you have any timetable for the attach, for the establishment of the um, e uh, ECA in Pearl River Delta? Well, uh, Christine slept. Um, even she, I think, cannot answer your question. Uh, I don't have a crystal ball. I have a cup here. Um, I guess I would say, you know, um, realistic, well, not realistically, uh, optimistically. Uh, the best we can think about would be 2020, at least. Now we have to do research, a lot more research. We have to demonstrate that you know we, we have done a lot on the land side, so that we now have to move on to the seaside and do something. We have to understand the inventory. We have to understand the competition issue. We have to understand the fuel availability issues. So these are all time-consuming research, at least a couple of years. And then you have that process of discussion between different players in the PRD, uh, the government discussion. 
And then you have to convince the central government to put together a proposal, and that process will also take a couple of years. Once you get the proposal to IMO, even, they, even if they approve the, appro uh, the proposal immediately, it will probably take another year to get it become effective. I'm just taking the example of the North American ECA. Uh, after IMO's approval, I think it takes another 12 to 15 months to get it on the ground, right? So if I just add all, the, all, all these together, it will be five years already. Okay, so realistically, I would say uh, the soonest 2020, then I'll be very pleased. Um, but probably 2020 to 2022. Now, but I have to say, if Beijing is convinced that this is something that we need to do, it may happen overnight. <laughs> okay, overnight. <laughs> I think there's another hand. Um, Mr. Tang? Yep, uh, YJ Tan from MSC. Uh, I just like to comment on the, the uh, comments by the gentleman talking about coal ironing and onshore supply. Uh, it could be one of the solutions, but nevertheless, I think we have to see the bigger picture because if you see the coastline, uh, if you even you provide shore power supply, what about all the vessels that are going through the steaming, through the passageways of uh, China up the river, and uh, you cannot eradicate. Uh, all these problems, the NOx and SOx, through the online supply. This is one of the solutions, but I think, like you mentioned, uh, you have to see other perspective, uh, being that uh, you have to navigate the ships, uh, in through all the tugboats, all this. So we have to take care of that element. Mm. On another aspect about the air car through China, I think it will be at this stage, I think it's a bit premature. Uh, for the fact that China is a, such a huge uh, country by itself and also the developments of all the coastal ports are at different levels. The stakeholders themselves, like for example in PRD and Yangtze River, consist mainly a lot on budgets. Mm. And I would think it would be a huge challenge uh, to impose ECA on them, how they survive and how they supply uh, as a supporting supply chain to the mainline carriers. Mm. So it has to be taken as a holistic approach uh, I agree that currently you take the main ports. This is where the international carriers are, are what you call, we can more or less abide by the IMOs. But when you go to the coastals, where there are a lot more uh, two barges, three barges, it will be a huge, huge challenge. And that I think that will take a long time. And I think the Chinese government will be uh, very conscious about how to change the whole industry. For the mainline carriers, we have all the technologies, the new engines, new technology that can burn cleaner fuels. But uh, all the barges we are talking about 10, 15, maybe 20 years old. That, that will be a different proposition altogether. Yes, I, I, I agree with you entirely because um, let's not forget, um, you know, apart from ocean going vessel, the international carriers, we also have, an, especially in Chinese ports, there are lots of uh, river vessels and coastal vessels, and they are quite different in terms of operation, in terms of their fuel requirements, and also their ability to comply with tighter regulation. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I try to, you know, invite some of the uh, the people from this sector to to this event, and. Um, I don't think they, they've uh, accepted the invitation. The, th the thing is, I, I guess the question is, they don't feel that this is uh, their issue at this point. So for us, I think we need to do more promotion ex and to explain to them that you know, they are part of this uh, discussion and hopefully uh, in the next or the upcoming uh, events that we're going to organize, we'll be able to engage the river and also the coastal and even the local vessel operators uh, in a much more effective manner, because uh, I also really want to hear from them their concerns, uh, and you know how and you know what we can do to help them, you know, start thinking about uh, an eco concept, because it seems just too distant, distance uh, from them. Just like you know me talking to you about climate change, or some of you, I mean, you feel that that's not your business, but as a matter of fact, this is affecting you. And likewise for the local vessels and the river vessels. Uh, the ecocom app definitely is something that they should take care of because it's coming very quickly and we really want to engage them and be part of the discuss discussion. 
um, but you know, um, more so in China, in sh uh, Shanghai, definitely, they have a lot of river vessels. And I think uh, the Chinese government, they are coming up with uh, different regulations uh, regarding their uh, ship design, uh, regarding their uh, uh, emission reduction uh, ability. Um, and with those regulation or guidelines, I think it will help uh, that particular sector to understand that they also have a role to play in this conversation. Yes. Simon, I think from, from our sort of personal contact in Beijing, we visited Beijing three months ago or something, I think it was made quite clear to us by some of the top universities there that actually central government is already working very critically on these issues and pinpointing uh, pollution from ships as one of the research areas. And if I understand correctly, Shanghai has just introduced new fuel standards right, for ships. So I think, uh, I'd like to think maybe China actually is going to move very quickly on this. And in the 13th five-year plan, I think all expectations are most of the, the key performance indicators will surround resource usage and the environment and also people's livelihood. So I think there's a major, major change in, in approach. But addressing the gentleman's point about tactics, I mean, China likes to pilot as with free trade zones, for example. With such a big country, I think you'd be silly not to pilot and launch something out on a, on a national basis. So tactically even, I think Pearl River Delta may, may serve a purpose in accelerating hmm. the uh, central government's wishes. And I think we, we can actually play a very good part in influencing the policy directions in Beijing. Well, thank you so much for offering your support and help. And definitely you were spot on on what you just told us uh, in terms of what's happening in China with the universities, with the research institutes, and also with uh, the high level government officials. Uh, I'm sure they want to put something in the 13th uh, five year plan on uh, emission control related to ships, definitely. Um, and if they can you know, get, get it black and white in that document, it will be a real boost for us to move forward together um, and try to get some real action done on the ground. Um, and um, Shanghai, uh, I'm sure Mr. Shen is going to share with us their latest uh, development in terms of policy in the afternoon. Um, I, I, I'm sure you can direct that question to him, uh, whether they are tightening their fuel standards. But I'm sure they're, I mean, they're doing a lot of things. Uh, everyone is doing a lot of stuff uh, in the time being. But how to coordinate all these efforts and using the key uh, you know, Delta region areas as the focal point and then to radiate those kind of influence to nearby areas so that the entire Chinese coastline will become ready um, to start thinking about emission control area. I think that's a, a good way to go. But you know, then back to ground zero or point, point, point one, uh, do they have an infantry? A ship infantry. So I think some of the small ports, they do not even have an emission infantry, so they have no idea how much emissions are coming from the ships and the port sector. And that needs to be addressed. Um, not just Shanghai, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, Hong Kong, uh, Qingdao, that's not good enough. We need the smaller ports also getting the infantry done. And with that basis, then we can start talking about policy, start thinking about emission control area, then bringing the partnership, think about engagement, how to work with the government to come up with, with a much uh, bigger plan uh, for the entire Chinese coastline. I think that's the way to go, really. Thank you. Uh, I guess you are hungry. Um, <laughs> should I allow one last question before we break for lunch? Yes. Uh, thank you. Jens Erik Olsen from uh, Eight Ships Hong Kong. Uh, thank you very much for, for your wonderful uh, seminar. Um, uh, not so much a question, uh, but uh, following on uh, what Joseph Poon uh, rightly points to, uh, uh, I think tactically uh, you, you may consider carefully uh, which, uh, which is your target group. I mean, the international shipping uh, will follow you uh, all the way straight away. Coastal shipping, half-half, uh, right? And that was perhaps optimistic. Um, a river trade, not at all. And, uh, you know, you, you, you want to reform the river trade, uh, laudable, I agree, it would be nice. Uh, however, you know, careful what you wish for, because what you might get is some 
did I say half-assed legislation uh, that doesn't really cut it. So, so if you want to have a first mover initiative, then go with uh, another buzzword, the lower hanging fruit, mm. and get uh, the first uh, parts in place. Mm. Because, you know, Confucius, hold this thought and the rest will follow. Uh, that's my recommendation. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for your wise word, and I agree. Um, we've been working with the international shipping uh, community uh, in the last five to ten years, and uh, I'm personally quite confident that you know we will be able to convene other meetings uh, after this conference to start that conversation. But I, I think you know we will also try to bring in other important players uh, to the room, um, and if they feel uh, well, if they haven't yet feel they, they are part of the discussion, then obviously we need to convince them that uh, at the end of the day they should be part of the discussion and be involved because uh, we really want to hear from different sectors with their input then uh, there will be a bigger chance for us to succeed in terms of getting what we want. Um, but I agree. Uh, uh, maybe we should do with some priorities uh, for the time being. But um, now this is just like a sharing uh, after one session, but hopefully during lunchtime and then during coffee break and after this conference, um, please you know, chat, please discuss, please brainstorm, and if you can come up with any you know, really bright ideas for us to move forward together to convene uh, new meetings, please let us know because we really want to facilitate this discussion because we feel that this is the right time and the policy window could be shut very quickly. So we have to seize this opportunity right now. And with everyone in the room, you know, roaring to go for this, I think we should take action, we should do it now. But thank you so much for your, for your support. Thank you.